Good morning. We'll continue with our lecture on the basis for seismic design and um, define how you arrive at the demands on different components, the piers that are going to be designed for a combination of gravity and lateral forces. So, um, with respect to the code that refers to the definition of seismic input, IS 1893 part 1, we have seen how the horizontal design seismic coefficient has to be defined for the building that you are going to be designing and um, AH which is, which is the design seismic coefficient requires the um, use of the zone factor Z by 2, SA by G which comes from the design horizontal acceleration response spectrum and with the selection of the level of ductility that you would like to have in your structure which determines the behavior factor. So, depending on the type of reinforced masonry or unreinforced masonry with specific seismic resistant detailing that you would do with respect to IS 4326, you would choose your R factor and the uh, importance factor based on the occupancy and the use of the building itself. Uh, for the value of SA by G, we make reference to the elastic design response spectrum and uh, the response spectrum that you see here is the one that is prescribed for response spectrum analysis. If you are um, working with equivalent static analysis, equivalent static uh, analysis instead of the response spectrum analysis, this initial part of the response spectrum, the ascending curve, the ascending portion of the response spectrum is not considered and instead you uh, start with a value of 2.5 at time period t is equal to 0 for equivalent static method. However, for the response spectrum method assuming that uh, you are using a response spectrum method to model and analyze the structure, this is the elastic response spectrum that you would be using from which you require the value of SA by G, but for the value of SA by G you need to be able to a priori estimate the fundamental period of vibration of the structure which in a simplistic manner can be estimated by knowing the overall dimensions of the structure that you are designing, H being the total height and D being the side dimension in the direction that you are considering the earthquake design. So, that is your initial estimate. Of course, after you model you can always come back uh, after doing a full fledged model analysis, come back and check if the TA that you have used is uh, good enough or would you want to make some iterations there. So, this is uh, required and once your AH is determined, assuming we are talking of the design basis earthquake where the um, level of earthquake input is determined by Z by 2, Z being defined for the maximum considered earthquake. So, once AH is defined based on the choices you have made, you then go and estimate the design base shear for the total building which requires the seismic weight W of the building. So, the seismic weight again requires a percentage of the live load to be accounted for depending on the level of imposed loads and it also should consider additional loads like heavy snow loads or sand loads if present in, in regions that are affected by uh, snow storms and sand storms. So, once the design base shear VB is estimated for the building that you are designing, we then move to the next phase which is taking that to different floors and then taking that to the different walls and the piers to establish what is the shear force for which you should design. So, today we will actually be looking at this transition from total base shear in the structure to the base shear that you would estimate uh, and the basis to estimate that for each pier. So, the first part is about a vertical distribution of the base shear to the different floors. Now, what does that require? It requires us to be able to define what is the seismic weight now floor wise. 
we had the overall seismic weight of the structure, but then we should also be able to estimate the, the seismic weight per flow and estimate QI which is the shear force corresponding to one flow, one story as the total base shear that you have estimated in as you see as you seen in the earlier slide multiplied by WI HI square where the I here stands for the story that you are looking at. WI is the seismic weight of a given story and HI is the interstory is the interstory height of the story that you are considering. So HI could be different for different stories and that is something you should be careful about. Typically H1 the first story may be taller than the uh, other stories and therefore WI HI square is estimated divided by the total summation of W j h j square where j is nothing but the number of stories again. So 1 to uh, the maximum number of stories in this case 4. So you are basically estimating in a proportionate manner how much flow shear of the total base shear should you apportion to a given story. So when you are estimating seismic weight care is to be given to uh, calculating the seismic weight because what we are implying in this model is that the seismic weight of the structure is lumped at the float level, right. It is a multi degree of freedom system composed of masses which are lumps at the float level. Now that requires a certain careful transition from the actual structure to this uh, lumped mass uh, idealistic model that we have. So what we typically do is every flow is considered to be composed of half the mass of the story above and half the mass of the story below. So if you look at W1, W1 is lumping half the mass from the top and half the mass from the bottom. What happens to the mass below of story 1? It is you are considering a fixed boundary condition and therefore that has no degree of freedom and so half the mass of the ground story is really not coming into the calculations. If you look at the top uh, flow, our fourth story here, it takes the load from the terrace, probably you have a parapet wall and then half the mass of the fourth story. So it is essential to estimate the uh, story masses which is then used to distribute the, um, the total base shear to the flow shears. Again <coughs> if you were doing this you can have different masses in different floors uh, and, and that is fundamentally the reason why we are trying to look at um, the distribution of shear forces based on the distribution of masses. In a masonry structure considering the fact that most masonry structures are uh, rather symmetrical in uh, their plan layouts and load bearing walls are continuous, the mass should typically be uh, quite similar along the height except for the uh, topmost story. So once you estimate Q1, Q2, Q3 and Q4 uh, at each flow, uh, you are basically ready to now take the flow shears and then distribute it in the flows. So what you are seeing here is really the um, conversion of the base shear that we had VB into the different flow shears and as you can see the summation of all the four shears Q1 to Q4 uh, can actually give you the total base shear um, VB itself. So once this is carried out you know what is the flow shear that each floor has to be um, designed for our focus now shifts to the floor itself. We now have to start examining different aspects within the floor. So again to come back to the terminology that I have been using, we are talking of floor shear, we are talking of total base shear, the floor shear and then we are talking of the different walls in the floor itself. Within each wall you have resisting vertical lateral load elements which we are referring to as piers. So the transition is total building 
to the floors, to the walls and then to the piers and your final goal is to be able to establish what are the shear forces per pier. Okay. So that would be a floor for you with different walls uh, configured around the plan. So each wall that you see here, each extension along the x and the y directions are, are different walls. Now the next goal is to be able to apportion this floor shear qi that we established in the previous slide to the different uh, walls themselves and then to the separate resisting elements within the wall. Now the walls can actually be solid walls with no perforations or walls with perforations. Now walls with perforations have to be dealt with a uh, little more carefully because it is more involved. However, if you have a wall with perforations as you see here, we have a door opening and another uh, large opening that is distributing, that is um, dividing the wall into three vertical lateral load resisting piers. So finally, we are interested in knowing what should I design H1 pier for, H2 pier for and H3 pier for or what are the values of H1, H2 and H3 and along with the gravity load you have the uh, demand to which you will be designing the structure itself, designing, uh, designing those components themselves. Now for that of course we require the definition of the stiffness of a pier and this is something we have already seen. Now uh, this requires a consideration of the boundary conditions of each of the piers and based on this categorization whether we are looking at a solid wall or a wall between openings we have looked at the ideal deformation under lateral forces of such walls. So a solid wall with no openings within it should be expected to have a cantilever deformation profile implying that the top of the wall is free to rotate, the bottom is fixed and we have in our previous lecture been able to estimate the stiffness of such a pier and uh, relate it to modulus of elasticity of the masonry, the geometry of the wall, H, length of the wall, L and T, the thickness of the wall. Now if it is a wall between openings, between uh, with perforations, then the pier that is sitting between these perforations is limited in terms of its deformation at the top, particularly the rotations at the top and you would have a shear deformation profile implying that the pier now has to be considered with a fixed, fixed boundary condition and for this case as well we have estimated what the stiffness could be. So you have the basic unit in, uh, in terms of estimating the stiffness of a pier but now the transition from a uh, wall to the uh, pier has to be established. Okay, so let us now focus on how do you go about estimating the stiffness of a perforated shear wall. The solid shear wall is not so much of a problem. You can assume that it is a cantilevered uh, deformation profile and based on the geometry and the assumptions on the models of elasticity arrive at the stiffness of the wall. But the complication comes when you have a perforated shear wall. So typically under the assumption of a rigid diaphragm, okay, uh, let us work with a rigid diaphragm at this point and also examine towards the end if we were not having a rigid diaphragm in the structure what were to happen in terms of distribution of the uh, forces to the walls. Now if you have a masonry structure with a reinforced concrete uh, slab, a reinforced concrete floor or a roof slab, typically assuming that uh, it is a rigid diaphragm is a rather acceptable um, proposition and we can then therefore as a consequence consider that the distribution of the shear force from the flow, the diaphragms to the walls will be based on the relative stiffnesses. Okay. So we are going ahead with that proposition. If that were not so, if the in-plane stiffness of the diaphragm is not adequate and we will see the limits 
on what is adequate in plane stiffness of a diaphragm, then the diaphragm could actually be classified as a flexible diaphragm or a semi rigid diaphragm. That creates a complication because you cannot now distribute the forces onto the walls relative to the stiffness. You have to adopt a different strategy. So now at, in this, uh, at this stage we are examining uh, the distribution of the shear forces to the walls uh, proportionate to the relative stiffnesses. So what is really happening is we need to be able to establish what is the distribution factor. I have 4 walls, I have 5 walls in the configuration in a plan. I need to establish what is the distribution factor with respect to the total stiffness of that story uh, which goes to the wall itself. So the distribution factor can, can simply be defined as the ratio of stiffness of the pier that you are examining to the sum of the stiffnesses of all the piers um, in the, in the, if you are looking at a wall it is the floor, if you are looking at the pier it is within a wall itself. So still it is simply Ki over sum of Ki and that is a ratio that you would use multiplied with the wall shear to establish what is the shear force going on to a single uh, component itself. Now the moment you have openings, the openings in a wall, it increases the deflection of the wall, right? And that reduces the stiffness of the wall. So how do you account for this is, is important. But there are some uh, complications. If you consider a, a, a regular wall which has window openings and door openings and ventilator openings, you have openings of different sizes in the first place. You have openings which are aligned at different heights along the height of the wall. And hence, how do you account for these different sizes of openings at different locations in a wall um, is a rather involved um, set of calculations. So this is what we are going to be examining. However, there are simple analytical methods that are prescribed based on um, simple statics that uh, you could use and we will examine three of them and you could use, um, you could use any of them. However, some of them have um, a level of conservatism which is probably not um, acceptable if you are doing a rigorous analysis. So the first method is the simplest method but you are bound to get a uh, percentage error in comparison to a more rigorous calculation um, which is not insignificant. I would say 5 to 10 or more uh, percent with respect to um, what would be a more rigorous calculation is to be expected in the first method. However, this method is also acceptable from an engineering standpoint and for a quick estimate this is um, accepted. Now what this method does is you assume you have a wall with openings that the stiffness of the wall is estimated merely from the stiffnesses of the piers by just simply adding up the stiffnesses of the piers. You are not considering the effect of the spandrel uh, that is typically present above the openings in the case of a window and below the openings uh, again in the case of a window. In the case of a door you have the spandrel above as well. So this sort of a, uh, a calculation really does not, um, does not give due consideration to these spaces what we are talking of. If you take this particular wall that you are seeing in the slide, I have two window openings they are of different sizes. They are all aligned at the same height in the wall. You could have a further complication that these are not equally aligned, one is a smaller window, the other is a bigger window or one is a door. So we have three piers between openings, pier 1, pier 2 and pier 3. Within that panel zone, the panel which is defined by A, B, C and D. You have the total wall and this panel within which the windows and the piers are. So now once the windows are uh, considered, then you actually have only three vertical lateral load resisting elements. Vertically aligned lateral load resisting elements are only piers 1, 2 and 3. What is prescribed in this sort of a approach is you simply look at pier 1, pier 2 and pier 3. Since they are sitting between openings, the boundary conditions are such that rotations at the top are prevented and therefore consider a fixed fixed boundary condition, estimate the deflections of pier 1, pier 2 and pier 3 and sum them up uh, to get the total stiffness of the wall itself. So the total stiffness of the wall 
is merely stiffness of k1 of pure 1 pure 2 and pure 3 now uh, you will you will definitely agree that we are completely neglecting the role played by the slab that you the portion of the wall the panel that you see above and the uh, portion of the uh, wall that you see below okay One, two, and three, yes. So, so the exactly one, two, and three. We've come down to the basic unit now. We've got a pier. Uh, we have two options there: either a cantilevered pier or a fixed fixed pier. In this case, since it is sitting between openings, we choose the boundary condition as fixed fixed, and uh, that is a solid panel with the boundary condition. And we've already established what the um, stiffness uh, itself is. And you're summing up the three stiffnesses, and uh, this is simply springs in parallel. Three, spring, three springs in parallel is the total stiffness of the system itself. So we then go to method two, which starts accounting for the effect of the large panel that we had above and below the openings. So what we are actually going to be doing in, um, in this second approach is examine the wall as a whole examine the wall as a whole but the wall as a whole is if you look at the boundary condition it the wall as a whole is not sitting between openings it is not restrained at the top so the wall as a whole can actually be considered as a cantilevered uh, to have as a have a cantilevered deformation profile so we could estimate the deflections of the lateral deflections of the wall assuming it to be solid cantilevered deformation profile then consider the strip within which the windows are sitting so you see in the second in the in the third picture <coughs> you have the uh, uh, basic configuration at the top the solid wall neglecting the presence of the uh, windows below that's the solid strip and then we take one small strip within which the windows are sitting that's the third one a b c d now that has window openings and so that's going to be restrained compared to the overall wall without any window openings so this is considered to be a fixed fixed pier and then we can go and estimate for the original piers that we had identified even in the last uh, method pier 1 pier 2 and pier 3 and calculate the deflections for that pier considering again fixed fixed boundary condition for the last case so here in method 2 what we are doing is first calculate the deflection of the solid wall but treat it as a cantilever second step take that solid strip within which the openings are sitting and calculate the deflection of the solid strip assuming that it is fixed fixed now because it really has um, these panels sitting on top and below that would prevent the um, the rotation of the top and the bottom so it's correct to assume that it is fixed ended then you calculate the deflections of each pier individually you have pier 1 pier 2 and pier 3 here again we are fixed ended and you can calculate the deflections delta 1 delta 2 and delta 3 so i have the solid wall i have the solid strip and then i have delta 1 delta 2 and delta 3 uh, estimated now to be able to estimate what is the actual deflection of the wall we are basically going to correct the deflections of the central portion with the deflections that we know at the top and the bottom so basically uh, again this is this is uh, an analytical approach it's uh, uh, we are correcting what we did in the previous method itself so what we are saying is the stiffness of the three panels stiffness together the let's call it the peer group the stiffness of the peer group k1 plus 2 plus 3 is stiffness of k1 plus stiffness of k2 plus stiffness of k3 now to arrive at the stiffness of k1 k2 and k3 independently individually we are going to introduce some corrections now we take the inverse of the stiffness and that gives us the deflections so 1 by k1 plus k2 plus k3 k1 and k2 and k3 are then represented as the inverse inverses of the um, stiffnesses so we write it down in terms of um, this value is equal to 
1 by 1 plus delta 1 plus the entire set in the denominator 1 by delta 1 plus 1 by delta 2 plus 1 by delta 3. But we also know that because of this, um, because of the fact that the reciprocal of the stiffness is going to give you the deflection 1 by k 1 plus 2 plus 3, the total stiffness of the peer group is going to be the summation of the corrected deflections delta 1, delta 2 plus delta 3. So, um, each of those therefore, the, the deflection of the peer group is if you use this which is nothing but uh, because deflections and the stiffnesses are reciprocals and the first um, expression we can then um, arrive at the total deflection this is of the peer group this is of the individual peers the deflection total deflection of the peer group which is the correction that we are doing as the uh, right hand side with the individual deflections reciprocals of the individual deflections on the denominator. So, what we are finally going to be doing is the actual deflection is our gross deflection which is coming from the deflection of the overall wall considered as a cantilever without any openings minus the deflection of the strip which is this plus the three deflections of the peers. So, still an approximate method, but it is um, something that considers the important role played by the uh, spandrel at the top and the spandrel at the bottom. So, this is finally, what you should be um, keeping in mind that we are looking at the net the corrected deflection as being gross deflection minus the um, strip deflection plus the three individual deflections of the uh, small peers 1, 2 and 3. So, this is uh, our uh, third case uh, second the second method. The third method is a little more um, systematic in terms of the considerations of actually how these stiffnesses are lining up. Okay. If, you, if you remember when I uh, talked about method 1, I talked about method 1 being uh, 3 springs in parallel. right? Uh, when we came to method 2, that gets a little cloudy, we do not define it very clearly. We are looking at uh, total and the negatives and then working on um, subtracting overall stiffness from um, subtracting smaller stiffnesses from the overall stiffnesses. In the third method, the third method is probably the, uh, the best method, uh, which requires a little more um, rigorous calculation, but really considers the, the whole process of distribution of uh, forces by considering them as springs in parallel or springs in series. Okay. So, if you look at the whole wall, in this whole wall the three peers, peer 1, peer 2 and peer 3 can be considered as three, spring, three springs in parallel. Okay. Now, if you were to consider the three springs in parallel with the beam or the slab uh, or the panel that is above right that is three springs in parallel with a panel in series now yes so the panel above with the three springs in parallel is a system which is in series similarly if i consider the three peers and the panel below that is a system which is in series so once i have established stiffness of springs in parallel and then stiffness of spring in series the one above and then the one below I then can look at the total uh, stiffness of the wall as springs in series. So, that is the approach this approach is, is probably the most um, convenient because when the moment you have uh, windows and doors openings uh, which are of different sizes, this starts giving you a better hold on how um, the stiffnesses contribute, individual stiffnesses contribute to the overall stiffness. So, in a simplistic manner looking at if you have springs in parallel versus springs in series, because in, in the whole wall it is a system of springs in parallel and series. So, uh, if it were, uh, if you were looking at uh, a set of springs which are 
Uh, in parallel, so if you look at uh, idealize your masonry uh, system as just having three piers, each of stiffness uh, K1, K2 and K3, then the total force that the wall is being subjected to is shared based on the just based on the stiffnesses and you get the proportions H1, H2 and H3 uh, which will then add up to give you H. Uh, again fundamental assumption here is you are talking about a rigid translation of the diaphragm. This um, cannot be considered if you do not have a rigid uh, diaphragm in the system. This, this distribution is no longer valid and therefore the total force H by equilibrium would be stiffness K1 into delta, delta remains the same for the entire system K2 into delta plus K3 into delta and therefore H by delta will give you the sum of the stiffnesses K1, K2 and K3. What we did in method 1 was only this, what we did in method 1 was only this. Now if you were to consider the uh, and therefore depending on how many of a uh, how many of a parallel walls you have, uh, you can uh, make a summation and get the total stiffness. If you were to look at a system in series and that is that comes into picture when you have a spandrel, an opening and a spandrel, a spandrel, a set of piers and a spandrel, you need to examine it in terms of um, system in series and so now the important difference is each spring will have its own deflection. Three deflections would then add up in this case with three springs as the total deflection uh, delta delta 1 plus delta 2 plus delta 3 to the lateral force H acting on the system. So here if you were to write down what actually happens is you take a summation of the uh, displacements delta being equal to delta 1 plus delta 2 plus delta 3, each of the deltas depends on the spring stiffness, H remains the same here, H is overall H is the same and therefore we can write down the stiffness of this sort of a system um, in terms of 1 over Ki summation over all the springs in the system. So this third method involves dividing the wall into the respective springs in parallel and springs in series establishing the stiffnesses of the um, respective systems and then putting it together in terms of the entire wall as a, as a uh, set of springs in series. So I get your question. So um, just to paraphrase what you asked me, as far as the first set of um, the first figure that you have seen, we are looking at springs in parallel and this is exactly what we did in method 1 which means those three piers which were running in parallel were considered as uh, piers with fixed fixed boundary conditions, right. So this is uh, piers with openings in between, so that is fine. The moment we go to the other one, we are talking of three sets of springs which are in series now and your question was when you are looking at the original wall that we were studying, it had in the central panel, it had uh, clearly the effect of the top and bottom uh, panels and therefore considering that as fixed fixed is meaningful. What happens to the uh, two strips at the top and the bottom? Strictly speaking they are not in isolation, they are all part of the same system and therefore the, the fact that the top panel then is uh, a, has a continuation in terms of what we have considered as the central strip, the boundary conditions need to be considered consistently. So we would still continue considering the top strip and the bottom strip not to be cantilevered but to have a fixed fixed boundary condition. And if you remember in method 2 we looked at the whole panel with no openings, there we went in for a complete cantilevered profile. No, I, uh, I, again I think this is something we had mentioned, I had mentioned earlier in class that we are not talking of the slab providing uh, rotational restraint. We are not talking of the slab providing rotational restraint. It is the presence of um, extensions of the masonry on either side of the top or the bottom that is providing rotational restraint. So if you look at a pier between openings, you have the spandrel zone at the top and the bottom. 
uh, on either sides of the of the pier that is what is blocking rotations so that is the reason why when we took the whole wall the whole wall really has no restraint it's free to rotate the slab might offer a certain uh, partial uh, uh, rotational restraint but is not as significant as what a panel sitting beside and preventing rotations would do therefore considering all the three to be having fixed fixed boundary conditions is the more uh, appropriate decision that you would take okay so you could then um, sum up the reciprocals of the stiffnesses in this case so if you were to look at another example uh, such as this one uh, a wall panel with a door opening a wall with a door opening you have two piers 2 and 3 and you have the the panel at the top comprising of the spandrel and the extensions on the two sides so in this particular case we are really going to be first looking at the system of springs in parallel which is 2 and 3 and then the system of springs in parallel becomes a system in series with the panel 1 and therefore the total stiffness 1 over k 1 plus 2 plus 3 of the group is written as 1 by k1 which is the one at the top it is in series now so 1 by k1 plus 1 by k2 plus k3 and i have already done the springs in parallel here adding the stiffnesses so this is um so th this is an approach that is consistent with the the actual boundary conditions and it's more meaningful to go with this sort of a calculation so ones you make these calculations you are then able to arrive at what is the uh, total stiffness of the wall the ratio of individual stiffnesses to the total stiffnesses gives you the distribution factor so the wall shear or the flow shear is then multiplied with that to uh, establish what is the shear demand on uh, the pier that you are working on okay so this set of uh, discussions that we've had so far um, where with respect to a wall with perforations now the moment i step um, take one step backwards and say okay i have a set of walls and now how do i distribute the floor shear to those walls what considerations should one make so the moment you want to look at floor plan configuration and the disposition of the walls within the floor plan there are two things that uh, need to be uh, looked at one is when you have a flow subjected to a shear force if the floor were to translate with no rotations then you distribute the total flow shear to the individual walls so assume the wall the building that you're looking at is made up of three walls and these three walls are now a system in parallel i can estimate stiffness of wall 1 2 and 3 relative to the total stiffness of the flow this floor is now subjected to earthquake forces from base shear i have arrived at qi which is the flow shear i now need to distribute the flow shear to this uh, to the three walls the uh, displacement of this flow given the symmetry of the floor that i am looking at in the direction that is being considered if i'm if i were to look at um, you need to look at the um, symmetry with respect to the direction in which the earthquake action is so if the earthquake action is parallel to the three walls you now because of the consideration of the rigid diaphragm uh, effect and the symmetry would have a uniform displacement of the uh, structure of the slab of the diaphragm itself and therefore delta will be the same for all the three of them and therefore distribution by stiffness is easy this is a case where you have translation of the system with no rotation right which means the total shear force coming to the floor has only a direct component a direct shear component which is distribution factor into the floor shear distribution factor into the floor shear for the second wall and distribution factor into the floor shear for the third wall only translational components of shear are coming into the picture however if and this is basically because as far as this floor is concerned the center of gravity of this floor the center of mass of this floor 
and the center of stiffness of this flow coincide. Since the center of mass and the center of stiffness coincide, I do not have any rotation expected in the flow and you have only a direct shear component. But the moment you are going to look at more complex configurations, uh, you are going to have a second component which is a torsional shear component that comes because of the eccentricity between the center of mass and center of stiffness and that needs to be established. So when you have um, an unsymmetric configuration, unsymmetric with respect to the direction of action of the earthquake force, you should be able to in addition to the direct shear component estimate what is a torsional shear component and add that in the demand coming onto the wall itself, uh, the separate walls. So in the previous cases owing to the symmetry you really need not estimate what the center of mass and center of stiffness is. But in this case you need to estimate the center of mass and center of stiffness and then be able to establish what is the eccentricity in the x and the y between the center of mass and center of stiffness because that will determine what is the additional bending moment, what is the additional shear force because of the twisting of the floor, right. So what we will do in the rest of this uh, lecture is to be able to establish a framework for estimating the torsional shear in addition to the direct shear component. So, uh, if, so if you look at a configuration which actually does not have the symmetry that we had in the previous case with respect to the direction of action, you will have to establish what is this eccentricity between the center of mass and center of stiffness in the two directions and then establish what each of the walls will get in addition to the direct shear component. If the earthquake were to happen in the y direction, you will have an additional torsional shear components in, in all the walls uh, and similarly in the x direction. So we will uh, continue with creating the framework for this in the next class and with that you actually have the entire set of um, analytical bases required for arriving at the component shear demand and axial force demand which then closes the loop in terms of system design to um, component design. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you.